Hi, Benjen. Is that the, can you hear me? Is that the meeting uh, notes from last week? Okay, we're looking. March and guess what? Yeah. So I'm staying in Airbnb's hashtag app life. And I'm telling the roommate in my Airbnb about open source ecology. He says, tell me more about open source ecology. It's Christopher Farnoff used to live at factory farm like six years ago. Yeah. yeah. I was just like, Oh my gosh, I love oh, it. No kidding. Uh, so he's going to be a roommate. Well, it's just, it's Airbnb. So it's just for as long as he's here, he's working on some kind of um, <laughs> neurotech for, um, for, um, basically using apps to cure addictions. Yeah. Well, how, how coincidental is that? That's, that's, isn't that awesome? Yeah. He was here for probably like half a year or so. Yeah. 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 Ago. Yeah. Very long. Okay. Yeah, he, he was, he was like, he was like playing down my, you know, and he's like, well, tell me about it. And I told him about it. And I told him about passing the dev test and, uh, you know, I said, just to know he cat him up on. He says, oh, what's the software suite look like? So I loaded it up and showed it to him. And he's like, how long ago was the picture taken? And I said, I heard him 14 years ago. He goes, oh, I don't think it was 14 years ago. And I'm like, why do you have an opinion? I didn't know, you, you know, I'm like, why do you have an opinion about this? And he said, huh, I wonder which one Marchin is. And then I was like, did I say Marchin? <laughs> so he like totally sucked me into it. And he's like, yeah, I used, I used to be there. <laughs> Yeah. Well, interesting. Okay. <laughs> Let's get on to the, the current me. I'm going to just paste a couple of things into the working doc. There's a few updates here. Recording is on. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I did any admin since the last meeting, since the sprint. So are you are you copying the slides or do you want me to do that real quick? Uh, so, no, go ahead. Uh, put it put in your info on the slide. Is that what you're asking? 
Um, yeah, I haven't updated them. I'll go ahead and update it and put the new slide thing in. No, but but uh, Abe's got it. Okay. He's got it. Uh, paste. See the see the chat box. Okay, so we've got the the new working document, everybody, on uh, in the chat box. Uh, Jen, maybe if you want to put it into current meeting, unless Abe, you've done that already. Let's see, is that under current meeting? Okay, Abe already did it. So we're all up to date. Uh, Friday, February 26 on the current meeting page on the wiki. So that's good to go. So a few things today. Uh, let's get going. Um, so I'll talk. So we had a nice design sprint on an open source golf cart is the first thing. Uh, just a little update on that. Then there's D3D version 19.02. So I'm still working on further refinements and refinements. I mean, really getting this to the industrial grade because the promise is industrial performance, fraction of the cost of the competition, et cetera. That needs to be delivered still. Um, definitely good work. So with that, uh, got new extruder design. Uh, there's also, I'll bring up the uh, concept of called MIG casting, which uh, I'd like to do. And another concept of the heated enclosure, which is um, actually really good too. I'll bring that up. Um, for Nathan, I got the sample prints. Um, Abe, you saw the, <clears throat> the clamp, the PVC clamp. If you wouldn't mind pasting that in the actual picture I sent you so that we see the physical reality of it. Okay, so let's um, let's start with the, let me share my screen here. So if you wanna, who's recording? I am recording and hopefully it'll keep recording. I am as well. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so when you, yeah, when you record, uh, maybe po paste, post to the, switch to the window of the speaker, speaker or the presenter. So like I'll be presenting a little bit on the slides here. So if you want to take a look at that. Um, okay, update on an open source golf cart. So it was an interesting meeting. It was, it was decent work. We put together a few, so it's the open source golf cart page on the wiki. Um, so we've got libraries to borrow from because we've done prior work on things like power cubes and frames. Wow, look at that. We've got the hydraulic motor that's catted up and that's Katie who joined us for the design sprint. So look at that, that's awesome. Um, you can download it here. In fact, I will do that just now because that's looking pretty tasty. And, and we actually came up with an interesting workflow on that part where you import images into FreeCAD um, and then simply draw all of them in Sketcher and then extrude that. So it's a very easy workflow. I did some work on a frame. So there, the frame's got three sides there, um, some other modules, but yeah, yeah, good stuff. So we were, we were working within a document itself. We'll continue. So whoever's worked on it, Please continue to, to do any of the CAD. And here is, for example, showcasing. Excellent. Very nice. And there's an image. Let's see how we generated this. So Katie, what she did was she took an image from online. We found actual specs of the motor. So these are uh, relatively decent dimensions for what we have for the actual hydraulic motor. I know the shaft is tapered here. It's a straight shaft, but we should have a tapered shaft uh, directly for wheel mount motors. I'm trying to access this image plane here. Uh, I'm not sure how that works, but um, hopefully we can document, get a good good instruction on how do you go from the 2D uh, fab or technical drawings, which sometimes you might have to scale. When you start, just get that off the internet, Will probably not be to scale, so you have to scale it to the proper scale. And from that point, whatever you extrude, draw and extrude from that will be the actual part. So that's that's good stuff. 
Okay. Um, moving on. So that's the open source golf cart. Uh, we'll do another, not this week weekend, but week from now, uh, two weeks from now, <clears throat> about we'll check back in. And by that time, we'll do some more work on, on parts, uh, putting parts into the CAD and see how far we get to the relatively finished design. We can maybe wrap some things up. Okay. Um, so my first part in the uh, team meeting there is continue to work on the extra. So if you look at that, uh, and let me put a link to this. Okay, there is the link. This is the updated extruder. So moving on and on with refinements and refinements, but um, what we see here is an assembly that's valid for now the Titan, uh, the Titan arrow with a volcano nozzle. Okay. So the former version of the extruder was one for just a regular nozzle. That means you can't do like really big nozzles like 1.2 millimeters or 1.4 millimeters or even 2.0 millimeters. I've seen nozzles that are 2.0 millimeter. But with the former one, the margin, the regular heater block is goes up to 0.8 millimeter. This is getting bigger and better. So, so I designed this um, on one side, designed a new fan and sensor holder that's integrated onto the front of the, the existing extruder. So you see on the left-hand side is the print that's 3D printed. And you can see there's a clamp bolt holding the, the sensor. So removed the, the nuts and washers, just did it with a single clamp into a tubular holder. And then the fan, the geometry of the fan shroud is completely different. It's, it's not omnidirectional now. Uh, but let me actually get in there and download the file on D3D V 1902 page. Um, and I'm actually cutting that all up in FreeCAD right now for the, the final version. So I'll download OSC Extruder 1902. I'll make a couple more comments about that. Uh, it was good in that once I designed the part, I worked completely within FreeCAD around existing part libraries. Like, for example, the sensor, we've got accurate CAD of. The little blower, we've got accurate CAD of. So as long as I was able to generate that well within FreeCAD, it fit perfectly. And so, so this is the design here without the fan. Let's see. So we can merge the way it is set up right now on the 19.02 page in the part library, the the fan and the, the sensor are separate files because they have detail, they have threads or fins, which take up a lot of memory. So I split that into two, but if you, into different parts, but if you just download the eight millimeter sensor, do that and then download the blower, the 5015 blower, that you can merge that into the FreeCAD file. And that it's been saved positionally correct, such that uh, if I'm gonna go to FreeCAD and go file merge, so I'm gonna merge my blower right there, it jumps right into place, and then file merge eight millimeter sensor and there it is so that's the assembly that's the guide rods that's that's a carriage piece um but you can see it's it's i like it it's cool look at that just freehand drew up this curved nozzle um just kind of looked at okay here's my geometry of the fan and the and the sensor and I just bent it, just drew it freehand in Sketcher and then extruded it. That's what I did. Um, and printing worked really well. Uh, printed on this bottom side here. So I started the print on this flat side here where both this ring and these bottom pieces were all on the print bed at the same time. Now, this bolts onto the front of the Titan Arrow extruder. Um, so you see this big block here that's the volcano block. It's the vertical one. It's It's got more distance. Like if you look, yeah. Um, 
it's going the long way so it can heat heat better. It's called the volcano heater block. Um, let's see. Where is my... Okay, there it is. That's the... There's that. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically the design. It clamps, this assembly clamps around the carriage piece. So, so the motor is now on top. And then the nozzle, if you look at it, um, look at the geometry here, it's basically right below the carriage. Uh, because this heater block is longer, you can put the extra assembly on top of the carriage. Now I have it upside down. But it's just enough so that the nozzle sticks down below the bottom surface. With the other heater block, that wouldn't work. We had to undersling the the extruder, meaning below the below the carriage. Now we put it on top, and therefore the omnidirectional fan shroud does not work anymore because there's no space for that. So just did this new fan nozzle like that, just one direction, uh, but that should be fine. Now the thing I don't like about the omnidirectional fan shroud is it hides the complete print. If you look at the former version of the extruder. Uh, this fan shroud hides everything here, so you can't see how your print is turning out, and you want to see it, like you really want to be able to look at it for the first layer. So that's a definite disadvantage of omnidirectional fan shrouds uh, when they cover the print. This one's on the side, so you can still see the print. Um, okay, that's about that. And continuing with the full cat of this uh, this uh, 3D printer using a 12-inch uh, frame. So we're using the 12, 14, 16-inch frames. Um, I'm moving forward. Good. That's my report on that. Uh, second, I want to bring up a couple more things. So uh, thinking about high temperature printing, because there's a lot of, okay, the problem statement on high temperature printing, and I'll, um, there's a page on the wiki, high temperature heated ex enclosure. Paste that into the chat box. A high temperature enclosure. Um, so I got thinking about, okay, how do you separate high temperature printing? Because some things, some plastics go really high. Like you can go print with plastics that you have to print at like 400 Celsius on a nozzle, where typically like PLA is 200 about. Uh, you can get into crazy stuff where a heated enclosure means that the print doesn't warp. That's good for polycarbonate. It enables, for example, uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, which are notoriously hard to print because they're always not the bad. They'll warp up. Well, if you have access to a bunch of different more mat other materials. Uh, so here's the concept. I just wanted to bring this up because I haven't seen this anywhere. Um, but basically, you've got the so this is our new extruder. You got the carriage, and attached to the carriage is a heat shield. And the the heated enclosure simply encloses the heated bed. It's not. It doesn't enclose the whole printer because the idea is if you enclose the whole printer, everything would get hot, and the motors themselves they can't get more than like 80 degrees Celsius. They'll just burn up. So that's why the enclosure, if you want to print at high temperatures, like this could get you up to like 200 degrees Celsius in the enclosure while leaving everything else cool because it's outside the enclosure. So there's the nozzle, build plate. The enclosure has basically got like felt or fuzz or like, uh, let's see, it will be something like fiberglass boundary between this plate. So the plate moves back and forth. As the printer prints, the plate is moving all over the place, but it's always keeping a seal on top of this chamber. So if you can picture that, there's a chamber that's enclosed. So it's, it would be something like, um, what what would be the material like? Could be some high temperature plastic. One one high temperature plastic could, for example, be PEI or whatever, or something like even uh, fiberglass insulated metal or something, um, where you keep the temperature hot inside, and and the bed can still move up and down because you have long slits uh, in that enclosure. So the z-axis can move up and down. But the xy, which is the bulk of the motion there, that's just all riding on the top, keeping that seal closed. As you see, heat enclosure has an insulating wiper on top surface. 
to block heat from escaping uh, around the heat shield plate. So the bottom overall heated enclosure can be as hot as needed as all the components remain outside the enclosure. Take a look at that. Uh, this is an easy implementation with our printer. Uh, so I'll be working on that as well because we want access to all kinds of print, printing materials at all kinds of temperatures. So not limited to stuff that's easy to print like PLA or ABS. Okay, that's that's about that. And the third thing I want to bring up is the idea of MIG casting. So the idea, it's a hybrid idea between a couple of a couple of different things. Um, the page in the wiki is MIG casting. I'll paste that in. So what is this? It's a hybrid bit between MIG welding and casting. Say what? Well. The idea about casting is that you have to melt metal somehow. Well, why not use a welder to provide that molten metal? So how does that work? Instead of uh, using an induction furnace or a flame to, to melt metal, uh, and which takes, this is messy, you have to have protective equipment, like a full body suit with face shield and high temperature shield on you if you're doing that kind of work for safety. Um, but here you can do, uh, this combines 3D printing, MIG welding and casting. So it's like investment casting where you make a form. So you always have to have some kind of a form into which you pour the hot metal. Here, the idea is 3D print something that you can then later burn out. So 3D print a shape that you want to 3D uh, to turn into metal, uh, put it into a plaster mold, like for example, plaster of Paris. So you can take a look at the links on the wiki there. Uh, you can look at 3D printing investment casting, which is actually from Lulzbot. That's, that's what inspired this. I saw that and got excited about this method. Uh, and then there's evaporative pattern casting. Look at that up on Wikipedia. And lost shell casting by another guy named Joshua Lecoq. Um, but combine these things together. So, so you're going to do a 3D print, then put that into plaster of Paris by pouring the plaster of Paris around it, and then you have a mold. Then you burn that out. Or if you have printed only a shell, you don't even need to print that out, uh, burn it out. The The weld itself will... We'll melt it out. So what you do is you have to leave a hole at the bottom of your form to put in an electrode because welding works on a closed circuit. You got to close the circuit. You can't just weld into a ceramic because you have to have a ground. So you put in a ground at the bottom, you weld into the container, and there you get a shape such as for us what would be extremely valuable is in five minutes if we have this form, take your MIG welder where uh, like a 300 amp welder deposits like about 10 pounds of, uh, of metal per hour. I was looking at the weld deposition rates, 450, 450 amp welder gets you 17 pounds per hour. You're talking about a lot of, a lot of metal. Uh, so you can do a lot of this stuff. So basically in five minutes, if you have the form, you, uh, MIG weld into it. And in five minutes, you can make a metal part that was initially 3d printed. Isn't that sweet? So I don't see why this would not work. It's a combination of where, uh, well, it's limited. It's this. This is not good for everything. You have to have access to the weld gun to to basically point the weld gun into the top of the whatever you're printing. But things like, for example, six spline PTO shaft couplers, six spline shafts couplers that have complex uh, spline geometries, or the the drive sprocket for the micro track with an integrated hub to, to attach to the axis, complex geometries that have, that can be molded in a mold that has an open face. So there you go. Take a look at that. Uh, this would be as fast uh, to prototype. This would be as fast as getting some plaster of Paris, 3d printing a part, making a mold by putting that into a, uh, uh, you know, like a gallon jug, put the fo form in there, pour the plastic of Paris around that, and then uh, melt out, burn out the form, or leave it in there if it's it's a shell, and then MIG weld into it. So it would be a quick experiment, a few hours of experiment to see if this actually works, but I don't see a reason why this wouldn't work. So I'll, I'll have to try this out because for simple geometries, they're still, I mean, simple, like a spline thing, like um, still complex, accurate geometries, but uh, limited, and then you can't do like closed, fully closed things where you can't get the MIG welder gun into 
the cavity where you're actually casting because the metal like it fills all voids right but with a mig gun you kind of have to point to all the voids with the mig gun itself so anyway uh, definitely we'll try this this is very exciting because if you can do metal uh, through 3D printing accuracy, then we have broken the one millimeter barrier, any type of uh, MIG gun based additive manufacturing. So very good news. This also lends itself very well to extreme manufacturing workshops because imagine we were, you know, we've got a busy workshop, we're building a tractor in a day can get a bunch of people with relatively no skill just doing this gun, gun, MIG welder gun based casting process just with a welding helmet uh, as a protective equipment so so this could really play well with extreme manufacturing workshops where a bunch of people can readily learn to do this um, so very good news okay um, that's about all I got on my side that's the kind of update um, let's go to next Nathan Nathan do you want to go? Or maybe questions, if there's any questions and comments on this, because this is uh, pretty cool. Yeah, cool I had a stuff. question on the I had a question on the bed and the um, yeah. the shield. Uh, how would you yeah. if if it was like a flexible fabric, like you know maybe uh, maybe if I realized fabric even a plastic, how would you ensure that you know as the X Y moved um, that it wouldn't drag the heat shield into the into the printed material or or move it around? Have you have you thought okay. about that? So well, yeah, so the nozzle has to be below the heat shield. The prints never go above the nozzle, and the heat shield is above the nozzle, like right above well, it, right under uh, the carriage. No, so so uh, that, that's the top of the heat shield, but I'm thinking about the fabric on the sides. Um, yeah. So how do you ensure that that doesn't drag into the material? Oh, uh, okay, so, so the... Ah, so the... Uh, the shield moves. The enclosure is stationary. Ah, uh, okay, got it. That thing is just fixed to the frame. Okay, and 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 so basically, it forms like a tent over uh, yeah. sort of. A, does does hmm. uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to ask my question. Um, so basically, the the. Okay, I th I think I understand. I think I understand. The idea is okay. you have a wiper, like the the fixed. Yeah, so that's actually I, I didn't specify that point, but yeah, the the heat enclosure itself is a fixed structure with a wiper on top on the top rim. So you're you're making this glide contact. So something like the top top surface of the heated enclosure, meaning the top rim, would have something like fiberglass. Um, like fiberglass sheathing or something, something that's soft so that the heat shield moves against it, keeping that, that closed. While being God. And the rest, and the rest of the enclosure is, is a fixed enclosure. Yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. This is, uh, by the way, this is feasible only with printers that have the fixed, the, the, Stationary bed, in other words, the bed is not like typical Prusa printers have the moving build plate. Right. And the, ac and the actual printing axis moves up and down. So you can't do that. It has to be with the system where the X and Y gantry is fixed on a frame so it doesn't move down. Otherwise, you'd hit into the enclosure. Got so, it. Okay. so only the Ultimakers and OSC printers do that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, Lulzbot, Prusa, most of the stuff out there is uh, a moving build surface, which to me, I mean, that's, I mean, I've always whined about that, that that's, you can't do industrial grade stuff with that kind of, kind of setup. When you have a moving build plate, you can't, for example, print tall objects, which would just sh shake off the surface if you're mm -hmm. printing at any decent speed. So yeah, this design is uh, lends itself to much more flexibility and quality, and it allows this enclosure, which kind of dawned on me. I was thinking about this um, after I put the extruder on top. 
it became obvious that, hey, now you can enclose whatever is below the entire axis assembly because the extruder is way at the top. It's not like hanging below. So it became mm -hmm. somewhat obvious that just the nozzle is sticking out and therefore you can enclose that whole whole build chamber. Yeah. Yeah. Which I've not, I haven't seen. This may actually be patented. Uh, I know there's a patent on heated enclosures out there. I, I haven't looked into it much, but uh, I don't think it matters because uh, we could innovate around it if, if this is enclosed already. No pun intended. <laughs> um, but because we published this here, this cannot be enclosed anymore unless it's already been enclosed. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Cool stuff. Okay. Because the wiki license is called CC by SA. So whatever's on the wiki, that, that's prior art for, <clears throat> and it's got a timestamp on it. So nice. There you go. Um, yeah. Um, s any other questions on a heated build enclosure or the MIG casting? OK. Uh, so definitely worth trying. Those are low-hanging fruit experiments. That can be implemented pretty rap rapidly. So see when I can get the time. I'm working on um, building the printer with the overslung extruder, the new extruder. So once I have that, maybe just uh, build the, the enclosed box around what's below it. Uh, we'd have to mount the, the heat shield somehow. That's not considered in the current design. So definitely would have to redesign just to mount a plate of something. Um, I was thinking like a good material for that heat shield would be, for example, PEI, uh, which is a high temperature plastic. Um, it melts at like 400 Celsius or something like that, 450 Celsius. So that would be a good material for a heating. And it's also transparent, so that, that would work. It's the same stuff that we have on a build plate, on a build surface, the stuff that makes prints stick to it. And when it's cold, they pop right off. Like, for example, here in my house, I'm not heating this part of the house. When you finish the print, typically you have to wrestle it. Well, if you don't have PEI, you definitely have to wrestle it. But with PEI, it's supposed to come very gently off the surface right away. Well, in this case, it literally popped off by itself because it was near freezing weather. So that PEI stuff really works for getting the prints off which also means a good thing for automatic part harvesting because you can simply bump bump the finished pieces off with a bumper to collect them so you could have like 24-7 automated printing, just part after part. Finish a part, bump it off. Finish a part, bump it off into a container. Things like that. Um, okay, uh, if no more questions, we can continue with... Uh, Nathan, do you want to you continue on stuff? So I actually printed... Let me actually share the... The screen here. So I did make a couple of prints. Okay, great. Um, so let's look at my screen here. I mean, these are the tiny prints, but yeah, I mean, the result is uh, so. First of all, like you print them, this they're like literally they're pretty glossy on the bottom pretty much come right off the build play. As I said, it's pretty cold in here. I'm wearing a jacket, not heating this this house here. Um, we're at the other section of campus. But the report on this is, I mean, the, the feature sizes are tiny, tiny. It's it's definitely small. Like when I actually touch it and feel the, you know, how tiny the little magnets would be, I mean, you'd really need tweezers. And I can tell you that uh, they're going to be jumping around. The holes aren't... I mean, yeah, getting down to, because th these things are like three millimeters diameter mm -hmm. and the depth of the side holes is like 1.5 millimeters, I think. Yeah. yeah Super exactly. tiny. I like, don't see this happening. Uh, so what, what are we going to do? I would say... What if we, can we double the size of these magnets? I mean, we have to make something bigger. Like, for example, also the little pinholes, like you see this, you have like the Lego block, like little protrusions. Yeah, there, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That are supposed to fit in the corresponding holes at the bottom for because these two pieces are supposed to snap together. Yeah. Uh, two pieces are supposed to snap together with uh, the magnets in between. Yeah, that's, they don't really fit. And if you see like the size of the feature, it's, I mean, it's way smaller than the 
the bumps on Lego blocks. So okay. yeah, I just can't get that accurate with a printer uh, at okay. this stage. Um, yeah. What do we do? So maybe try to convert this to six millimeter magnets. Can we do okay. that? Um, yeah, yeah, we, we can definitely give that a shot. Um, can you, uh, so your screen resolution is kind of low. Um, so it's kind of hard to see the, the detail on those, um, on those. Can, can you, picture? yeah, can you just take a picture and uh, either post it on my log? Yeah, probably just post it yeah. on my log. So do, do basically double the size of the, of the um, magnets. Of the magnets, okay. Which is not a problem for the the flat laying ones. Yeah, but for, for the ones for edge. The, yeah, the ones on edge. Just make it make it so when you close it, the magnets really like hit to the side. That's fine. Okay, got it. So, uh, so my concern, my main concern, is for the um, the walls that. So those are the the six inch, the six and a half inch thick walls. So basically, for the exterior walls, we have yeah. some thinner walls that are four, you know, four inches for interior walls. Do you want me to make the magnets hide? Do you want me to design it such that the magnets hide in the four inch walls as well? Uh, and you use the same magnets? Yeah, you, yeah. You're using the same, same magnets, but, but yeah. basically, basically making the design on, you know, making the design on the six and a half inch walls larger than it needs to be to accommodate the four inch walls. Yeah. Is what I'm, okay, got it. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So you talk you talk about the magnets jumping around. Did we talk at all about putting possibly putting ridges or fins? In, I don't know how detailed the printer will get inside the holes, so that like when you put the magnets in, it moves the plastic. You know what I mean? So, like if you if you put thin fins inside the holes, like little tiny ridges, and when you put the magnets in, that'll kind of create a a tight fit for the magnet. So they won't jump around as much. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to do, right? Okay. Uh, that's. I mean, <laughs> that's news to me. Um, I mean, uh, is that are what you I saying? Should kind be? of like lips. Kind of like. I don't know what are you talking. You you. How, where would you put those ridges? Because I mean, you got to insert the magnet. Where do the ridges go? Well, if you if you put really thin, like really thin ridges inside the holes, then when you put the magnets in, it'll it w ostensibly would like bend the plastic if the ridges are thin. I don't know how thin the three D printer can get. Yeah. But that's like really but, common for fitting things together. So, you know, so so they'll kind of break down as you put the magnet in, but it'll hold the magnet. Yeah. I have no uh, idea. Yeah, but then you've taken up space that the magnet has to go in, and the space there is tight enough already. The plan is to glue the magnets like usual, right? Uh, is, is it? I, oh, it is to I glue the magnets, but I'm telling you, before you're going to glue them in, they're going to all jump at you. Yeah. So you have to have it's a really pattern. Or so it's, physically, it's just very yeah. difficult to get them all. Like, if you have two magnets... Fine, maybe you can do four, but like you know, beyond two, hmm. it's tough. And and some of these pieces, we're gonna have more than four magnets, probably like eight magnets in a piece or something like that. I'd have to go to fast um, contact glue or something like instant, and do one yeah. magnet in one piece of plastic at a time, because those are tiny things. So if you're you're making yeah, a lot of those at you once, can. right? So you just glue one magnet, and then keep cycling yeah. while the glue dries. Yeah, and that process takes forever, unfortunately. We've yeah, done that yeah. kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, yeah, we, we have to basically be able to get the magnets in there, have them hold by themselves somehow until we're ready to... Because in principle, we actually don't wouldn't necessarily even need to to glue them if they're inside these, these double sandwiches. There's no reason to make the holes a little bit bigger to account for the fins then, for the ridges inside? Yeah, I'm having a hard time seeing how you can get the resolution on that ridge because because whatever you're gonna print, it has to be like absolute minimum is like one millimeter. Ah, you can't can't really do like a ridge like a thin thing that's like I less gotcha. than a millimeter really. I got gotcha. you. Um, yeah. Is this something that we can mold? Could we do like um, molded plastic? 
Well, yeah, but that's, I mean, that's totally that's different. Um, totally different technology, though. It's That it gets into the idea of that you have molds that you then squish molten plastic into, but that's, the molds are expensive. That's the, they're metal, typically. And that's the reason why 3 printing is good, because you don't need those molds, right? I was wondering so, about doing, like, um, like 3d printing like a it wouldn't work for these like 3d printing a form and then filling with plastic but i don't know if it would be hot enough to if like would necessarily be so hot it would melt the plastic when you filled it uh if you're using something like the pei plastic which is printable at very high temperature you can possibly use it as a mold for stuff like pla or or some other things which have which are at 200 celsius for their uh, melting point. Yeah, for lower temp. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Po no, no, I haven't, uh, haven't heard that, but that could be possible if you have some high performance plastics that are really high temperature. That would be doable. Um, but then again, if you're not going to be able to get the resolution issue, which I think is what you're driving at, because you're printing with a 3D printer. Isn't the resolution if it's not that accurate? If you're printing, I guess that fast or. Uh, isn't there a certain amount of texture and roughness to the uh, 3D print as it is? There is, yeah. But I guess you're saying yeah. it's not super accurate to a millimeter. Is that mostly just because of the print speeds and uh, or the nozzle? Yeah, we could, because... yeah, like we can um, do smaller nozzles. Like, okay, this was 0.4 nozzle. You can go down to like 0.25 nozzles. Uh, tighter layer resolution. You can get more detail, but I mean, just after I've seen this, uh, I can tell you I wouldn't want to be messing with those those small magnets. So we'll, mm -hmm. I think let's start by going to a little larger size. Like first of all, like these tiny magnets are so tiny that you can hardly pick it up between your fingers, you know. And when they're so strong, you, it's like it's actually going to be difficult to take two of them apart because your fingers are so big compared to the size of that magnet. I mean, it didn't really occur to me un until I finally printed these out and these things, I mean, the features in them are very, very small to the point that you definitely need tweezers. And how do you take two magnets apart with tweezers? Okay. I don't know if it's possible. Martin, I, I, was, really... I, I, I was thinking about it. What if you um, kind of 3D printed a part that's basically like, you know, just like a stick. It has a little hole in it that you glue a magnet inside. Yeah. And then you can stick that on top of your stack of magnets and then slide it off. Yeah. Yeah, you can. And then if it then if it holds in that structure that you put it in, that'll be good. But if it doesn't hold, um, it, it's yeah. kind of devil's in the details on this. But but wow. to make it simple, like as a first pre first step, okay. let's enlarge it. Okay, got it. No, got I mean it. It was interesting with the, so we were using 12, 12 millimeter diameter, diameter magnets for the former versions of the 3D printer, but people just really didn't like it because you have to hold like, like you have to be very careful when you're working with that because you yeah. have to hold all of them out, you have to redo it, and people just ended up hating it, you know. Everyone said, let's get Got rid it. of the magnet, which I was like, oh, too bad, they're kind of cool, but it's dexterity-wise, it's, it's not easy. And yeah, especially if people are, don't have good dexterity, it's going to be like really frustrating. Don't, <laughs> just like before the workshop, tell them all to grow their fingernails out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, all right. But no, this is cool. Um, I see promise in it's like, yeah, I mean, look at that. My new house right there. Yeah. Um, code, most definitely. Um, that's all right. all we could model, you know, we get them in windows and, doors and there you go. Yeah, I mean, I, be, before because that's the, you know that's that's a lot of that's a lot of um, more design work than kind of the simple designs I've been working on. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, the the design was you know solid before we proceeded. So um, I will just you mean uh, with a little house model. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. I I wanted to get the feedback be before I started working on the doors. Oh and the yeah, walls, just it's I, as simple as that. And think about it like um, imagine we have this modeling kit of build, buildable panels, it's something that literally anybody can do. So it's it's good. I mean, it might look ridiculous, but no, it's not. It's If you think about doing basic functional stuff, like a lot of people can't even do that, which you showed there, right? Because 
you know, yeah. you have to have some skill. But if you show a pattern of how you can do that exactly with these modules, then literally anybody is able to do that. And I think that's really valuable. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, like, I, 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 it seems like it seems like what what's good about this project is that it's like if people start doing it, it's like really accessible to kids, and so you have yep. high user adoption, and so you basically like Absolutely. you're kind of leveling up sort of the public on in in terms of like sort of I guess OSE literacy. Yep. You know, and so uh, you basically mm -hmm. have young people who are eager learners um, who are yeah. you know start, start, starting kind of at the basics. Yeah. I agree with you. And uh, I am still very excited as I, I start talking about the curriculum aspect, but, you know, we have all our complex stuff, but curriculum wise, you know, offer this as a kit for students to do free CAD, to do real design, like little, little additions to the set and all that. So we can definitely uh, put some attention to getting this into schools for people to, to make meaningful stuff. Cause I know in school, of course, we don't do a lot of practical stuff, but this could be an example of really practical stuff. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe um, the next step would be just, you know, redo one that's doubles the size. Just send it over to me at ASAP and I'll just print it out and get, get your feedback real quick on that, how, how that's okay. looking. Um, sounds, yeah. Sounds, sounds great. Um, sh should, I, should I just uh, share my screen for the rest of the group? To yeah, go ahead. And show them what I've worked on? Okay. And whoever's recording, uh, grab Nathan's screen. Um, all right. So uh, I've basically, let's go back here. Um, these are sort of like a place of full parts of the library. We just pull a file and free that. This is the local. Oh, All right, here we go. Um, so if we look here, you'll basically see, a, like, <clears throat> I made it so that uh, you can put the magnets in flat. And so if you have, you know, walls that are uh, connecting to other walls in, in a, like, so walls running perpendicular to it, the walls yeah. can run into it um, at pretty much any, any point, every six inches, I think. I mean, well, six yeah. inches in, in the real world. And then on the end, on the edges here, I basically um, put these these same magnets in that you can put them in vertically so that basically you can have two walls butting in perpendicularly to each other. And then you print off two of these, flip them around and stick them together. Uh, that's what these uh, things are for right here and these um, little cavities so that basically you can print off. Uh, it's the same part, but you print off two and then you have a, a full six inch um a full six inch wall. Uh, and the, the reason we're doing this is so that the magnets are totally, totally hidden. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then we have other things like we have, you know, let's see here. We have our roof module and that's pretty similar. Um, change, I change the, um, I changed the design around a little so these have you know four positive uh things where they all stick together so that when we print off this it doesn't have any uh it doesn't have any positive um doesn't have any positive uh i guess you could call them lego connectors uh so that when you print it off it there's no tilting on the on the bed or anything like that so it's pretty simple um and so this is for the 12 inch thick um roof module but yeah it basically same same technology and so all, you know, creating all those holes is kind of tedious, so I just basically wrote a Python script to automate that. And so, it's can you show that script? Where is that script? Uh, so that's on your log here. Okay. Uh, can you? Yeah. I'm going to download it. Out. Let's see if you can explain it. So the way, um, just just so we start getting familiar with how scripting works in in FreeCAD. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So let's see. 
Yeah, let, let me go ahead and open up the script here. Yeah. So um, it's it's dot pi and freecat. So what do you do with it? So you you open up freecat and then what? Um, you open up freecat. So uh, let's see. I'll open this up in. I like Sublime Text Editor. That's like by far my favorite text editor. Um, basically, what, okay. So uh, I'm pretty much reverse engineering this. I'm I'm not great at Python or just scripting in general. But basically, right. anything you do in Python, you know, if if you go to View, you know, here I'll close this. If you go to View um, and you go to Toolbars and you sh uh, Workbench, of course. Mm -hmm. Shoot, I'm not sure where this is on my Mac. Um, basically, view. Yeah. Do you know where the Python? Um, um, so view toolbar is not. not, not. So um, view panel. So any action you take in. Um, in uh, yeah, there's I mean, yeah, it's uh, tools you actually take in in the console. So recreate any action you take through the but it's always back in the console. Right. It's a ran through um um, you know, sort of one whole model, and then kind of made some loops uh, to make to make those repeat calls. Um, and then of your screen. I can only see a small picture side, but whoever's recording, are you capturing the full screen? Hey, Benjamin, are you catching the screen? Yeah, I don't think that there's a choice that you see. I don't know what that is. Great. Can you see the editor? Yeah, I think you did, Bill. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, or, 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 so you're basically cutting and pasting on screen. Into the, the Python console with yeah, basically. Um, okay. and there's not be your before it all. Um, Um, automated, but I don't think we'll see that. Yeah, that'll be on Linux. Um, <laughs> but b b basically, you can automate um, all of your um, subtract from there to kind of keep your windows and everything like that. So, like for example, the logic in there condition. So you have to you have the generator. So this all this stuff uh here that's on the free cat um and this create definition called after call. Um that's just adding a circle and you give it your your coordinates. Um and I created this.
long as the less than the years. Um, basically, bad. So, until, you know, it's good to have a great place for building a lot of laws. That's not a yeah, I not all the way up to the top. It's kind of messy because there's a lot of there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, uh, free CAD stuff that you kind of just need. Um, Do I make a comment more clearly in my code? So that yeah, actually, yeah, like, um, I mean, what would be useful is like free CAD script one like. Can you do like um have the work document that you do like a little document that so we can sure have a lesson that's very specific to RC, but then others can build upon it and we can actually kind of follow what you're doing a little more. Yeah, most definitely. Do do you want the video to be like do you want the video to be high density or do you just want it to be kind of like a slow tutorial? Because like you you have high density videos on the Freak Out 101, um, right? And so, uh, what what do you prefer? Um, well, I think um, don't have a, don't use a lot of dead space. <laughs> no, I okay. just, um, I mean, because because yours yours was uh, I, I was I was really surprised um, at how much information you fit in there, and I I I think your philosophy behind it is really powerful. Well, the truth behind that video, it takes takes one minute to one hour ratio of editing. Yeah, so. no, I, I I do not doubt it. I, I was <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty impressed. Um, but so, do you want me to do some strive for something similar to that? Yeah, strive for something that's dense because um, I mean, we can always look up stuff on the internet and stuff like. I think a lot of times it's important that people get the overview of what's going on like pretty quickly. So, cause it's really about re repeating it, just going through it again and again until you really get it. Okay. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, definitely my stuff. Um, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I thought it was something good to work on. Um, for what well, we looking for on the printing designs. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. And it takes like right now, one of these pieces, twenty percent infill. It's like twenty-five minutes for the four, the two, two inch by two inch for the squares that I did, and the panel by four inches. Uh, but really, it's like when you think about this, it's one millimeter to one inch, about in real life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pretty much. Um, the twenty-five by four. So that's about one million. Yeah. Yeah. In the real Real close. Kind of 24, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I had one. I had one question. Yeah. Um, about um my design. So in the guys, um, let's see here. I wonder. Uh, let's see. Here. Um, in the in the um. Let's see here. The project that you shared with me, for the guys in sort of the yeah. Um, I can't see my screen, but um, maybe record the game. Yeah, um, so much more better. Instead of printing it as a solid paper, kind of like they have internal, like it's sort of a web. Um, so I kind of have a lot of screen. Um, would, you, would you like me to work on something like that, or take over? No, it's that's not nicer. You saw what percentage infill it has. It's not dense inside. It's actually like honeycomb. Ah, got it. Okay. Yeah, and okay. I did this at twenty percent, so it's a lot of honey honeycomb inside. Hundred percent means solid, but twenty percent is pretty light. God, okay, so that's that's all that's all covered in the slicer. Yeah. Perfect. Too easy. Yep. Okay. But great. there is optimizations you can do later on, like you know, like if we're actually doing rigorous production engineering on this, there might be places where, you know, 
we don't need the insides at all. So just print, you know, design the shell in FreeCAD. And then it's sli when it slices it, you have 20% with the empty space inside because you designed the empty space inside, you know, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, got it. Okay, so it sounds good. Is, is there, are there um, any resources for 3D printing um, on, on the wiki? Um, there's not a lot, like the curriculum is not there, but Apropedia, so let's look at this because there's actually pretty good stuff from the Michigan Tech Open Source Sustainability Tech with Dr. Joshua Pierce there. Okay. So um, Apropedia.org, and there's a, there's, let's find this real quick. 3D printing tutorial, 3D printing curriculum, let's see. 3D printing curriculum. What well, they've done. 3D printers education, let's see. Uh, can you share your screen, Martin? Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So, Apropedia.org slash 3D printers education. Is this the place we want? Yeah, 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 that is. I'll paste the link. Um, and we want to prepare something, like kind of adopt that for us. I haven't taken a look at it that much. We're going to kind of refactor it for our purposes. I guess they talk a lot about their printer. Uh, there might be some other page on there that, let's see, there's design software, education tools. They have a link to see me educate 3D printing curriculum. Let's see. I think there was something else on Apropedia besides this page. I'll... Oh yeah, there's actually, um, I think a 3D printing course. Let's see. Let's see, MTU classes. There's some course at MTU, Michigan Tech University, that was dedicated to 3D printing. I can't find it. I'll take a look at that. I'll get back to you on that one. There's... Um, Let's see. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Sounds good. I, I, was, I was wondering if there was kind of anything like similar to the similar to the uh, I guess FreeCAD 101 thing, where it was just like here's a bunch of threat, like good best practices for 3D printing. You know, just things to keep in mind, or here's like 3D printing with with FreeCAD or something like that. But um, okay, cool. I'll I'll, uh, I'll 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 look through that wiki. It looks like there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Okay, we'll find that another time. Okay, continuing here. So good work here. Uh, and on the clamp, so you're doing some more. We got a crazy clamp. Okay. Yeah, okay. My connection, unfortunately, was a little spotty. Some while Nathan was talking, and so I missed some things, but. Um, Hopefully there'll be some other recordings are better, but I, I think I see what you're talking about on the on your log and so on. Um, I, I was kind of looking at some FreeCAD macro code stuff as well earlier. Um, 
kind of after uh, the design sprint, uh, there was let's see some some question about uh, I guess the issues with the it was partly really the tracing, but I was looking at how difficult it was to make a sketch with rounded corners, and so I was trying to. Uh, see how hard it was to constrain that stuff because I think some of the issues we were pointing out with the um, uh, uh, sketcher was, was getting the, the things constrained uh, for, for parts so that they're accurate and, and so on. So I think that yeah. was an issue with tell me, the design. Hold on a second. But, but tell, me, tell me more about the idea of this crazy hole for the, uh, for the PVC. Yeah, so I uh, the email, it, it sounded like you were saying, um, from, from the photo actually was what I was trying to figure out what in the email, uh, and what I was trying to figure out what you meant by that. And I think I understood, it's like you're suggesting oh. maybe making the clamp a little bit asymmetrical or part of it would be shaved off. Like you've been in the photo, you've inserted uh, a bolt there, I think, or you, you're pointing in no, the no. bolt or no, I, on the bottom left, but I think. think I think, I think you were trying to say that one, one, one was, sh would, if one was shorter, so it would be, uh, uh, if, if the parts weren't the same, then it would apply a different clamping force, I think is kind yeah. of what you were saying. But, but no, I meant a different thing. So look at, look at the, um, look what I just did on this. If you take out that, that part, just shave part, off a little bit. Um, of... Do you see well, what I'm saying? So, so, so the issue is if I, I it's because it's symmetrical, if I shave off a little bit, it'll just be shorter. I, I was about to do that. I was like, I'll shorten the side, but actually it just, because it's the same part, unless we do two separate parts, it, it will, um, it'll just make the clamp shorter, right? Because it's... it's well, it's just very minimal what you have to take out. Yeah, really I guess minimal. You just need some I thought paper. about changing the shape of it that way. If it was shaped different, maybe it would do differently. But uh, I deal with with the um, uh, changing the, the the inside hole. It might be more adaptable and, and compress more if the hole had you know some teeth or something. And I just started scribbling, trying to get that to. Uh, yeah. To something and, and it messed up some other things so i have to redo some sketch stuff there but yeah um yeah, it doesn't it looks ridiculous but having teeth in there would reduce some of the plastic in the bulk part and make yeah. it flex and that might make it clamp better so yeah but you need clamping distance so so that hole compared to what you have right now if you make it slightly smaller it would provide that clamping activity. Slightly means like one millimeter larger, smaller diameter. Just a smaller or diameter. Yeah, I take it that you put it on like a, a furniture leg there. I take it that that looks like it's you know, about three quarter like PVC. Because I, I made that whole, the, the actual diameter of um, the specs for the three quarter PVC. I just left it. Exactly the same? Yes. It was five, yeah. Can you start maybe five. by taking... Okay. Can you do a version that's like one millimeter and another version two millimeters um, smaller? Yeah, yeah. I think that could do the trick. I mean, all we need is just a little bit of clamping. Yeah. Because right now we don't really have any clamping. We're just relying on the fact that they're just the same size pretty much, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. To get a nice... It fits well, actually. It doesn't yeah. slide offhand, but... I think it will slide down. Yeah, so, so how, I wonder how, how flexible does it feel? Does it, it, it no, it's gonna, not flexible. It doesn't feel no. flexible unless we're printing this out of flexible materials. Yeah, okay, so it's pretty pretty solid then. It doesn't yeah. seem like it's gonna, it's pretty sturdy, I guess, the, the parts that are yeah. thin aren't too thin or anything like that. No, they're they're good. Okay, okay, yeah, because... I put uh, the bolt in there just to show that it's, uh, that's how it clamps on, it's just to demo. Yeah. Okay, okay, I guess, I guess just making, making it a little, little bit, bit um, yeah, yeah, a millimeter or two smaller, that would be a good start. Um, yeah, I, I figure having, I don't know, I don't know, the teeth thing would be hard to figure out what exactly they should be shaped like. So, yeah, making it, well, what size they should vary from, um, yeah, I mean, if they're a millimeter over and under, but 
by adding the teeth, you make the whole thing maybe more flexible, and so it, some of them stick past the the original shape and or the the actual PVC, and some of them, you know, I was trying to draw it just in general how I thought it might be efficient, but yeah, it's it would make it more flexible, but it, it would be so variable it would be hard. Um, so yeah, I'll make it. Uh, hmm. Yeah, when with us. Radius, it, it shouldn't have to you know vary what? much. So. But tell me, tell me why you don't like the, the idea in the red. Um, let's see, so let's see if I make it shorter. But you're not hard. making it shorter because the hole is already accommodating. Like the hole will not allow you to make it shorter. That space will appear there, and it'll be just pinch space. It wouldn't make it shorter. Okay. You'd only be making it shorter by the amount you pinch, yeah. pinch in a little bit. It, I would have to, yeah, I'd have to adjust the shape, yeah, just right. So it would, it would kind of uh, bend the um, the thin parts in towards, yeah, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah. But you don't need to, you don't need to make any modification outside of trimming off just a little bit, like two millimeters there. Yeah, I think as that's easier because once once you start reducing the whole size then you don't have a good fit on the actual PVC. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I have to adjust the shape of that a bit so that it doesn't actually shorten it. Um, yeah, to, it has to be an odd If you do what I showed, it, it doesn't change. shorten it, though, because the, yeah. the hole constrains it to that same distance. Doesn't it? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, it would fit, and then maybe there'd be a gap even uh, at the PVC. Yeah, I guess I see that. So, so yeah, I can I can I mean, try that's, that. That's a fixed hole there. It'll be easier. Um, yeah, it's not going to reduce. That hole will keep it the same same spread. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to look at. Yeah. Do that. Do that uh, one. I'm telling you, that's going to work. Again, um, yeah. I've seen that with uh, like. Like working with metal, um, I can tell you that it's the wing structures, which is what you're creating here, is like wing structures. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff works well. But once you start changing the diameter of the like a shaft and a and a tube for the shaft, mm -hmm. that the bad fit just makes it not really work well because you don't have good contact. Okay. Huh. Yeah. yeah so the yeah. In metal. The, I'm the sure teeth. it's going to be like the same in plastic here. Teeth won't provide enough friction, yeah, or, well, they might flex too much and then not hold well, okay, yeah. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, yeah. So, yeah, the clamp. Yeah, just a minor trim. That's a quick quick job. You just uh, do a sketch on that surface and trim it. Okay. It's a little bigger. Yeah, I started to um, do some stuff on it. I, I made a... I repo to put some freak head macros on because I was working on stuff to make that go faster. Because I noticed a lot of these things that we draw a lot in freak yeah. head, they um, some of them are a little hard and there's a lot of time spent. And plus, when I was trying to make the freak head macro, it, it, the sketcher was behaving a little as it gets more complex, it wasn't behaving very well. And so that's exactly why you kind of need to bake out. It, it's more helpful to make some of these uh, macros for commonly. Uh, drawn uh, shapes and so on so i'm going to try to do a little more of that but um nice. i know too you have to refine the code a lot by hand sometimes too or you have to think out how you make the macro and record it ahead of time because it um it, the behavior of the program can you know get it where you make a lot of mistakes that you have to manually edit the code if you know how or you just have to re-record it more than once but um either way i'll try to get more stuff in uh, macros of that kind of thing uploaded and I think that'll make it easier uh, save some time anyway uh, and people it might, I found that often working and looking at with other sketches I've learned a lot from that because I think people uh, first starting out they don't know how to the best way to start out drawing things and you can learn a lot of tricks just by looking at other people's uh, examples and sketches yeah. and things like that so I think the macros kind of do that too because you can make like a generic macro that draws like a symmetrical shape and then it may be even faster to go in and edit that into a slightly different shape uh, than it is to just draw something from scratch. Uh, and that give also people something to look at and learn kind of how some things are done. 
So. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's mostly. It. Oh, oh, on the golf cart in general, to continue with that, um, I was trying to simplify the seat and that kind of stuff. Um, I started to draw, I think, some sketches in the golf cart document. I think I linked that on my slide there. Or, yeah, golf cart doc. So I started sketching stuff in there because I had been changing the cat a little bit. And I started on slide five because I was trying to think of how to make the, the bench seat that I was working on more, not just simpler, but maybe that module itself could be simplified by making it integrate and just weld into the whole frame. Uh, so probably design it yeah. a little different than I had started to. And I know we were worried about it being flexible and all kinds of things, but if the frame is just like a big cube, which, uh, yeah, makes sense. I mean, it's not like this thing needs to be aerodynamic. It gives you lots of space to put stuff in in the, in the vehicle. Um, so I still think how to how to make some uh, braces and, and just tie it in with the rest of the, the frame. So I think it'd be good to have a, I mean, maybe that's not a priority, but it'd be good to have more discussion and uh, maybe uh, just sketch some things up. It's almost faster just to draw things out on paper sometimes and uh, maybe share photos. But uh, if we get a better idea of the, the measurements, because all the, the parts are, you know, inevitably related to the other parts. So until we set certain standards, which I guess that the outer frame size, that's kind of fixed. So everything else needs to just be drawn to fit inside of that. But yeah, I think there's probably still questions about like the roof and, you know, how that, how we cover everything and all that. So um, it's kind of hard to decide what to do on the CAD or we just end up making lots of changes uh, if we don't have enough right. set uh, specs set kind of to, to know what to, to do exactly right we got to start fitting the parts into the final CAD to see how things fit together kind of iteratively all we know is the frame size is a certain size and we just declared it make things fit in there for now yeah so on the frame do you think you've got a, a cube kind of started for that um, do you think you want to yeah. make it more trapezoidal and kind of refine that shape more I mean obviously it's going to need more no, I can't tell what Putting on motors and wheels and stuff. Yeah, it's like, going to need power cube. We got to see how things fit in it. It's also going to be a little, little more complicated, yeah, because it needs more bracing and, and things to mount things to. So, um, I guess that the question is just the the motors, motor mounts, all that stuff. So, yeah, um, I have a. I also have a question on the clamp still though. So I'm looking at um, the picture we had. In the work document, um, looking at page eight from before. No, page six. Page. I'm noticing that the, so the nut catcher is no longer inside the the clamp. You had a nut catcher inside the clamp before, right? Here. On slide seven. Oh, so let's see. In this document, seven. Um, that is there not? There's a nut catcher on. Let's see. On this clamp. On the current clamp, that there's, it, to get it, uh, short enough for the right. Yeah, I thought that would be an issue for the short side. I figured the, the nut catcher on the current clamp on one side. Obviously, there's a deep. Uh, Oh. you know, hole. Oh, but I see. on I the see. other side, there's, um, well, that, that photo you're looking at there is, uh, you know, messed up, but the, um, so let's see in, in the clamp normally that you printed the, um, the nut catcher on one oh, side is very, so it's very thin because I couldn't, yeah. uh, obviously recess it through that, that thin part there, if that's what you're referring to. Right. But we're addressing that because the nut catcher is going to be in the 3D printed piece. Yeah, well, obviously there's okay. nuts on, on on both sides, but the yeah the the um, the axis bolt that's longer, uh, it, you know, it, it bolts through and it recesses over there. So yeah, there's I figured the question would be 
I forget that the yeah, there's the question of which side the nut goes on or the bolt goes on, which I think it's easier to put the nut in the uh, 3D printer axis part, right? And then push the bolt through, except for on the thin one where the nut, it might be easier to put the nut on the outside and just have it be in that short recess and then the nut would stick out. Of course, it could be the other way and the bolt could, the head of the bolt is going to stick out on that thin side just because there isn't enough uh, space. But I don't think it'll be in the way of anything that I can see because you can just face it towards the outside and then it doesn't interfere with anything, best I can tell. Yeah. No, okay. I, uh, I was just uh, questioning that part. But no, that the nut, nut catcher part is addressed. Okay. Thank you. I'm trying to open up. Are you still doing work on the PVC full frame assembly or mini PVC? See, one week ago you'd made some... I, yeah, I haven't reassembled anything to that because, uh, well, I, I think I updated the front of clamp there, and I, I don't know if I updated that into the into the main file. Uh, I thought it, some of that, but it needed to be, I think, kind of restructured because it wasn't quite updating automatically, but... Um, yeah, I, I need to do a lot more assembly there. Um, and first of all, yeah, let's first just have the clamp the, how that works. Yeah, and go I'll, from there. I'll adjust the clamp first. Yeah. Yep. Yep. One thing at a time. Excellent. Let's see what we got here. Yeah. Oh, okay, I see. It's some of the. I see. Yeah, you put in. Uh, updated clamp into the assembly there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it looks pretty good. I mean, cool thing about it is like, you know, the clamps are 3D printed, we can print the corners and the tubes even, so very much largely 3D printed. Yeah, that's good. All right, so next, let's see if anyone else, uh, do we have any reports from anyone else? I haven't heard back from any homeschool programs. I'm going to try to find time to follow up on that this next week, but I might be um, completely sidetracked preparing for the hackathon and finishing the filling out our stuff on democracy lab. Okay. So I don't have any update besides meeting Chris, which was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's getting me set up with some environment. With some what? Uh, with a, some new Python stuff, you know, so I can, like, do more self-study and get places. Yeah. I'd said environments, new environments, helping me organize stuff. And he said he'd, he'd help um, help me, like, I don't know, wrap my head around the hackathon thing. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, cool. Uh, all right. Um, so that's so we've got a few things in progress from the housing to the PVC clamps, the open source golf cart in the works, and moving along. So yeah, we'll continue work work on this. So yeah, let's uh, take it away until next Tuesday. So we'll do the meeting next week and then a follow-up design sprint on the on the open source golf cart after. Okay. Um, Mar Marcin, um, yeah. I had a quick question. Um, this last week I, I, I had an idea that I, I think is pretty cool, but um, uh, it was basically like where people could start up sort of like micro maker spaces in their yeah. own, in their like for example, like a garage or something like where they could say, okay, I'm gonna like provide a certain you know provide a space for people who are want to do 3D printing. 
And so they, you know, build like an OSE 3D printer and then um, for people to like gain access to the space, they need to like do some design work or learn free CAD or things like that. And then you could basically have it so that you build up like social currency, almost like a cryptocurrency or something so that you can then like buy, I don't know, um, it's so like if, if you learn free CAD, for example, you get like, you know, 20, 20 bucks or, or 20, 20 OSC bucks or something like that. And so you kind of gamify learning this stuff, like, again, sort of like striving for OSC literacy. And uh-huh. then at the same time, it allows people like in their community to build things that, you know, for like, I don't know, like things that people can actually use in their community. So it kind of really at like a really basic level starts starts alleviating that sort of um, artificial scarcity. And then as it grows, then like one person's like, oh, I've got some more space, I'll have a foundry. Or another person's like, oh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll have a wood shop. Or another person's like, oh, I'll have a guard, I'll have a gardening center or something like that. Yeah. What do you, well, what do you think about I mean, Well, it's, it's great. I mean, someone's got to do it, you know. Uh, for us here, we're... Um, We've got our facility, and it's still about getting, yeah, building, you know, building and they will come kind of deal, you know? Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. Um, uh, so I, I guess like, like, you think about, so you're thinking about starting something like that yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess so. I'm, I'm looking at um, maybe looking at a, a job or something in, in Austin, Texas, and um, I just kind of, I mean, I want to, do something along these lines and you know I, i'm like well this I, I guess you know start start where you can you know um yeah so i i guess like if if i were looking into something like that you know would it like how like would would you want to be osc affiliated or would it just be totally on its own but you as osc technologies i mean it'd be great if we coordinate like you know, have people join the development team. The bottom line, I think, is in, in getting real products out there that can work. Like, for example, if you're working on the on the house modeling kit, I yeah. mean, getting that to a product is the prime thing. So for you, I think it would be pretty important to get your hands on a printer so you can okay. really keep working on this and make it into yeah. a decent packaged product because that, that could be like your – now you could create your own um, – CD home prototyping activity around that. Yeah. And also you know, making kits, selling them. Cool. Good. Okay. Nice. Yeah. 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 It takes, you know, it takes time. And, but, but I think the number one thing is to, to have packaged products. I mean, that's, that's where I like our trouble is right now is we don't have packaged products. We're working on packaging some things, but that's mm-hmm. the thing that we really need to do because that's going to get the financial feedback loops happening. Um, when we can actually put like, you know, buy buttons on our website and get revenue coming back because that's, uh, we haven't worked on that so much throughout the history. We've done a lot of workshops, but we got to package products of all sorts. So really put put attention to enterprise development aspects. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yep. All right. Well, that sounds good. So I think that's good for today. Uh, thanks everybody for participating. And yeah, we'll take this next week again, Tuesday, 2 p.m. Central Time. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. Good meeting. Good meeting and yeah, send on the recording. Yeah, I hope recording some has of stopped. People got some good recordings because uh, my my audio was spotty in a few spots this time. Okay. But I'll, I'll yep. have it uploaded pretty soon here. I'm going to stop it now.